Uh, we have uh, this morning on this primary election, which, because it's West Virginia in 2024, feels kind of like it's general election day because of the way the, the state has gone voting-wise. Even though the breakdown, as sent to us by the Secretary of State's office, is 40% Republican, 30% registered Democrats, 25% unaffiliated. Those unaffiliated ones vote Republican quite often. Most of the time, yes. I'm really surprised at the low number of non-affiliated. In the elections past, they've been close to 30, 31, 32 percent. Well, the this third party, the, the, it's 25 percent unaffiliated and then 5 percent with the, the minor parties in the state. Yeah. Yeah. Via telephone, the fourth and final candidate of our morning who is running for governor, Moore Capito. Moore, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me on. Glad to be with you. Pleasure is ours, sir. You are a person who has held elected office, so you have a record to run on, so to speak. More tell us your major accomplishments while you were in the House of Delegates and the Judiciary Chair in the state of West Virginia that would help qualify you for the position of a governor. Well, thank you, Rob. I'm the Get It Done conservative running for governor. I'm a sixth-generation West Virginian, father of two kids, and as I always say, the future of West Virginia is deeply personal to me. It's personal to so many West Virginians. I'm the candidate in this race that has actually lowered taxes for hardworking West Virginians. I'm the candidate in this race uh, that has increased options for parents with school choice. I'm the candidate in this race that has increased our salaries uh, for our teachers and school service personnel. Uh, I'm the candidate in this race that wrote the bill to ban sanctuary cities, that wrote the bill to ban China from buying farmland uh, in the state of West Virginia. And I'm the candidate that's increased opportunities for entrepreneurs and innovators multiple times so that we can grow our small business. We're very proud of being the Get It Done conservative in this race, and I have a plan to take West Virginia to the next level, and that's exactly why Governor Jim Justice has endorsed my campaign. We're proud to have him on board and have been campaigning with him for the past two weeks. Bill? Yeah, good morning, Moore. Uh, a couple of so weeks ago, uh, you published or released a poll, which I think you probably sponsored, that showed you had a three or four point lead over over Patrick Marcy. Uh, do, you, do you have a comparable poll that shows similar numbers today, or how do your internal polls look? Well, thank you, Admiral. It's good to, good to hear your voice. Uh, you know, we, uh, we look great. Uh, everywhere we go, we've driven over 100,000 miles now on this campaign, uh, spent the entire day across the state. The momentum on the ground is huge, and the enthusiasm is massive out there for this election. Uh, I will tell you, uh, you know, I'm no pundit on polls, but what I can tell you is one thing that's been reflective in any poll that we've seen is that our momentum is tremendous, uh, and our opponent. Uh, uh, sort of flatlined, and that's been the case uh, across the entire campaign. Uh, we have tremendous momentum coming into today, and that's exactly where I want to be uh, going into Election Day as voters are hitting the polls, and it's a great feeling to have. Now, you uh, you have, I think, rain in Charleston, uh, fairly heavy rain, I understand. Is that going to dampen the uh, the turnout to the point that you think it'll make a difference? I can't let that one go without saying I appreciate the pun you put there with dampening. Um, but uh, <laughs> unintentional. But, but was, that bill's a funny hey, guy. That was, a, that was slick. That was slick. Um, and there was another pun. Uh, but uh, I will tell you that um, you know what we just uh, Liberty and I just came back from the polls, and I will tell you that uh, there was a steady flow of people uh, at at our polling place. And uh, it seems from what I'm hearing that everybody's getting out uh, to vote today. You know, West Virginians aren't going to be deterred by, uh, by, by weather, um, considering, you know, the weight of what's on the decision uh, on the ballot today. And so I'm, I'm not deterred by it. And I don't think voters will be. And in fact, as I'm looking out right now, my window, the clouds are beginning to part. Mr. Gilstrap. Good morning, Moore. Uh, I believe John, in, you? I'm well, thanks. I believe in getting ahead of issues here and looking at the Facebook feed on, on our channel here. People are concerned about the legacy name and, you know, there's don't, we don't want to put too much power into one family. What is your response to that? 
Well, I think what I would say is uh, what I've always said is that, you know, I love my mother. Um, I, um, I love my papa. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to give my mom two great, uh, you know, two really solid grandkids. But I'm my own man, and I've run this race on my own record. We've gone out there and we've talked about the accomplishment that we've made in the legislature uh, to create more jobs and more opportunity and to increase our infrastructure assets in West Virginia. So, you know, this is about creating a brighter future for West Virginia, and that's exactly why our message is resonating all across the state, uh, and I'm very proud of that. So as a get-it-done candidate, what is your get-it-done plan for education? Well, we've released our plan on get it, our get it done uh, message on our education is our A plus West Virginia plan. That involves getting more teachers in the classroom, accelerating credentialing for our teachers so that our class sizes uh, will decrease. So we have more attention on individual students. Um, we want to increase pay for our teachers, particularly in counties like uh, in the Eastern Panhandle where competition is particularly difficult. We know that we are able to increase pay for teachers and reduce taxes at the same time because we've actually done it and we've grown the surplus and we've held a flatline budget. So uh, that's a critical piece of it. The centerpiece of the A-plus for West Virginia plan is our West Virginia Ready Plan, which means that every high school student in the state of West Virginia will be able to either go on to the military, have a workable trade or vocational skill, or be able to go on to college. We need to create more options for our students and I will do that as governor. And of course, our, the plan that we have for veterans, we're gonna make sure that our veterans and their families have uh, educational resources and that the state is, um, you know, is catering to the needs of those that have sacrificed for this country. And you know, the, the most important thing is we're always gonna put parents first, making sure that parents have a choice in their children's education and will expand school choice. I invite you to go look at our plan. It's on our website at morecapito.com. It's our West Virginia, uh, A-plus for West Virginia education plan. More Capito, our guest here on the program. More, tell me about how locality pay becomes a real thing in the Eastern Panhandle and not this mythical hope that's out there. And other areas of the state as well that might need it. Well, yeah, absolutely. And we've talked about this. Like I said, I've driven, uh, you know, 100,000 miles across this state just listening to folks and one of the critical issues that we learn, particularly in the Eastern Panhandle and the Northern Panhandle, is the competitive pay issue uh, or locality pay, as you call it. We have to be supportive of, uh, you know, increasing uh, the pay that we provide our teachers in those areas so that and law enforcement, too, uh, to make sure that we're competitive and our communities are staying safe and uh, we're getting the, the, the requisite teachers in the classroom. There's no question about that and do we structure it as a incentive pay to make sure that we're retaining those teachers obviously we don't want to just sort of give uh, a bunch of money we don't want to throw money at the problem we've been guilty of that before and as your governor i'll never just throw money at a problem but we need to do it in a responsible way uh so i'm on board with making sure that we can do that can the governor do that on his own or does he need the legislature to pass a bill my understanding is that the legislature would obviously need to be involved with that. And quite frankly, um, there are things that a governor can do um, on their own. But uh, I'm a firm believer in a team effort. So I think it's always best to get the legislature on board. I have, uh, you know, I think one of the things that separates me in this race is that I have tremendous relationships with folks in the legislature who I've worked with over the past seven years. And we'll come to a solution to make sure that, that happens. More obviously, pay is important, uh, both for the teachers and uh, and law enforcement and everybody else. But there's other aspects as well. Going look into the school system, we have many problems. Our test scores, our discipline problem, the security, the safety of the schools. What is your, and you mentioned the salaries, but how would you integrate all these other concerns to the point that they can be addressed in mass? Well, we need to activate one of our greatest strengths in West Virginia, and that's our community. There's no question about that. I've said for a long time that we need more mental health professionals in our schools. Um, you know, we have such a high percentage of children that are in school right now uh, that aren't living with their parents, uh, which is, you know, a difficult thing 
for a child. And we have to make sure that when they're coming to school that we have the mental health resources there to, uh, to be able to cater to those needs because we know that students uh, learn their best when they're healthy. And, you know, the other part of that, and as I talked about it on the panel with you all uh, when I joined you uh, in Martinsburg, was, you know, we have to educate our families and our children about the community resources that are existing. You know, I, I often I've, I've talked about the Martinsburg Initiative. I've talked about communities and schools which exist you know, throughout West Virginia, which brings mentors into our schools for children that are struggling. Uh, we need more of those programs and wraparound services for our students so that the stress can be taken off of our teachers and then so our teachers can actually do what they've been trained to do. So I think a lot of it, quite frankly, Admiral, is getting those um, community assets, that, a lot of which we actually already have in place, but really educating our, uh, educa educating our educators about what is out there and the resources that are available. It seems like we have a very top-heavy uh, education system in West Virginia. Would you be open to taking a look at restructuring the State Board of Education and kind of just taking a look at, at the entire system and rejiggering the system to, see, to re give more control at the local level? Yeah, I mean, you took, sort of took the words right out there, um, John. I'd say that, uh, you know, I've always said that this is why I've driven all over the state of West Virginia and been to every single county because I'm a firm believer in local control. That's probably most important when you look at education. Uh, one size fits all does not work uh, really for anything, uh, but most importantly doesn't necessarily work in education and in order to sort of cater to the needs of the individual schools we have to listen to the uh you know to the professionals that are in the county that are uh, in these schools and so the answer to your question is yes I'm, i think we need to provide more local control i don't think there should be any sort of um you know orders coming out of charleston i think that is a failure from the bat um so we will not uh, conduct ourselves in my administration that way it will be certainly a bottom-up approach, and I think it will have more successful outcomes if we do it that way. Let's examine uh, foster care in West Virginia more. Department of Health and Human, uh, Human sorry, Department of Health and it used to be DHHR. It's got a new name now, and three different branches of it, and sure. I can never keep track of that. Uh, but uh, tell me about your plan to make sure that that split doesn't equal three larger individual segments of government when you add them up than what we just split. Well, here was what we found out, I think, before DHHR was broken up, was that there were there was sort of silos that were established within the department, and as counterintuitive as it might be to separate those departments, <laughs> literally creating separation of, uh, you know, the departments from within, um, we have to make sure that we're communicating. Um, you know, there's so much, as I often say, you know, there's, we don't want too much uh, redundancy in government. We need to rely on our community partners. I touched on that a little bit earlier, but one of the critical pieces, you know, to the, what's going on in our foster care system and with our CPS workers, I mean, it's, it's really underpinned by what's going on with the scourge, uh, this drug crisis that's, that's hit West Virginia and been here for for a while now. We have to make sure that our drugs are off our streets. We have to have the safest communities in the country. That means making sure that fentanyl dealers uh, that are pushing poison on the streets of West Virginia go to prison for life. That means that human traffickers need to go to prison for life. We need to take the supply of drugs off the streets so we can let our families heal. And when our families begin to heal, uh, I think our communities get stronger. We take more advantage of the resources that are on the ground and in the communities. And I think that starts to provide better outcomes for our families, which is what we all want. Yeah, more I, local control. I'm a strong believer in local control. I also recognize that all counties are not the same. We're in the eastern panhandle are blessed with a very with a robust economy, uh, very progressive in a lot of regards. Uh, other parts of the state do not have this. Uh, can the some of the more poor parts of the state, can they assume the local control and achieve what you would like for them to do? I mean, absolutely. I think that, you know, local – That I've, I've really sort of said that throughout this campaign is that throughout that 100,000-mile journey of this campaign and listening to 
tens and tens of thousands of West Virginians across the way. Uh, I can tell you that each community is passionate about the place that they live. Uh, they're passionate about the state as a whole. Um, I've shared stories that I've heard in, you know, southern West Virginia in the eastern panhandle, and they've resonated. And I've, you know, shared stories that I've heard in the eastern panhandle in the mid-Ohio Valley, and they've resonated. I think it's about telling those stories. But local control is, is critically important. And I've said as governor, uh, we'll have regional offices across the state with representatives from the governor's office. We'll have an office in the eastern panhandle. We'll have an office in north central West Virginia, in the northern panhandle, in the mid Ohio Valley, in southern West Virginia, um, to ensure that uh, you know that, that that the governor's office is participating in city council meetings and county commission meetings and board of education meetings so that those entities don't feel like they have to come to Charleston to be heard because I'm a firm believer that the solutions to the challenges that we face in West Virginia come from the ground, and that's the way that we find those solutions. So 100,000 miles, tens of thousands of conversations. Through all of this, what are the big surprises? What priorities did you come away with that you didn't think you were going to have? Well, that's a really good question. You know, at the end of the day, I think every you know the people that I've, I've spoken to uh, want much of the same thing. We want a safe community to raise our kids in. We want a safe community uh, to be able to go to work, uh, to open a small business. We want greater educational opportunities for our kids so that they're not being told to just go to college and they have uh, a greater opportunity to enter the workforce. We need bigger paychecks uh, for our jobs, and that means certainly ensuring that we eliminate the income tax in the state of West Virginia, which I will work to do every single day. Um, and, and one of the things, you know, to, to really hone in on that question, John, I would say housing. Housing is really a big issue, and it's not just a big issue in the eastern panhandle. It's a big issue all across West Virginia. We need to make sure that we have, um, you know, the housing that's available to, to grow this state, because as we go around, we know that there's a big shortage of it. Uh, for what people are looking for. What's going to be the engine to drive all the uh, uh, the programs you're proposing? Uh, uh, more, they're all great programs, but they're going to cost money. What's going to be the engine? Well, my answer to that would be that I've done it before, Admiral. When you look at it, um, I'm the candidate in this race that's lowered taxes and increased teacher pay and still created a budget uh, surplus in the state of West Virginia and keeping a flatline budget. So when we look at all of that, I am the candidate that has kept a flatline budget and, again, been able to reduce taxes, increase pay for teachers, create uh, incentives for our builders uh, in this state to, to build homes, and we've done all that. So economic growth is the key to ensure that we don't base build on our budget and that we create surpluses. But, you know, the idea that we cannot continue to lower taxes and create better paying opportunities for our teachers and our school service personnel and our police officers and our firefighters is an untruth because I've done it before. You've seen it happen. We're sitting on a surplus right now while we've done it and we'll do it again. More final minutes are yours as we uh, move through this nine o'clock hour to those who have not yet voted today. Tell them why you should be well, their vote for governor. Well, I really appreciate you having me on. It's been uh, such, a, such a great time getting to talk with you all all throughout this primary campaign. I look forward to, to speaking with you throughout the general campaign. I'm more capital. I'm the get-it-done conservative. I've turned good ideas into good public policy. I'm the candidate in this race that has lowered taxes in the state of, in, of West Virginia. I'm the candidate that's increased pay, spread school choice, uh, you know, shut down our border and banned sanctuary cities. Um, I'm the get it done guy, and I will tell you I have a plan to take West Virginia to the next level. You can check those plans out at morecapito.com. I'm the only candidate that has plans. This is a two-person race uh, with a very stark choice, one for the future uh, or one to stay where we are, and I'm that candidate that's about the future. So I would be honored and humbled to have every single one of your listeners' votes. Thank you, More. Appreciate it. How will you be spending the rest of your day today? Just like we had the past 17 to 18 months out there on the road listening to folks. Uh, this is all about building a better West Virginia together, and that's what we're going to continue to do today and throughout the rest of the summer and in November. Well, have a great day, and best of luck to you today. 
Thank you all so much for having me on. Thank you, Moore.